Okay, so we'll start off just by looking at the ESA website. So some of you be familiar with this already, um, using it for uh, documents like certificates of origin and things. Um, you may have done a carnet application as well. Um, so the website link is at the top there, you can see. And we've got a few options here. So obviously being the UK, we want to select the UK homepage. So if you don't already have a user login, um, what we'll do is you can scroll down and go to sign up now. And this is your user profile. So to begin with, um, you're making your own user login. So this is your name, your email address, you do your password, set the T's and C's and click sign up. So when you sign up, ESA will email you an auto email just telling you that you've created your user profile and it will prompt you then to make a company account. So once you've done your user profile, you either need to create a company account or you need to contact the admin of an existing company account to link you with them. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to log in myself. And you'll see when we get in, there'll be a few options. It doesn't take you straight into your applications page. So it takes you to this login landing page. So there are a few options when you get in. So this is your user page. Um, at the top, there are a few actions here. The main thing that you want to um, really understand is the My eCert section here. So you can do, you can launch eCert from there. You can check your profile and amend any of your details there. You can add a new company account here. So if you don't get the email link or, or uh, click on that to create your company account, um, you can log into your user account and just create the new company account there. And you can also change your password as well. So I'm just going to show you the new company account. So we'll do this as if you're starting from scratch. So you would create a new exporter account uh, or you can join an existing account if there is one. Um, if you're a new employee, for example, and there's already an existing account, you would click join and you would need to know who the admin of the account is. And you pop their email address in and they'll be notified that you want to join their account. <clears throat> so if you're creating a new account, just tick create a new and it will bring up this new page for you. So you just fill in the box by box. It will ask you the chamber required, um, the service required and the chamber that you want to register to. So we're Bristol Chamber, also known as Business West. Um, so you pop in, uh, this will be auto-populated, your chamber contact email. Fill in everything else. So this is your company name information now because you're creating your company account and you accept the T's and C's and then it will email you again to say that you've created your company account. So you can create as many company accounts as you like. Um, for example, if you're a forwarder, you may choose to have um, multiple exporter accounts if you're acting on behalf of them. Um, or you might be, we find this a lot with production companies, you might have subsidiary sites, or subsidiary um, company names, and you want to have a company account for each one. So you can create as many company accounts there and you can be linked with each of them as well. So if you have multiple company accounts, um, you can then see them in your drop down box here. So you'll see select account, you'll click on there and any that you are linked to as a user will show in your drop down. So you select the company account that you want to do the application for. So we'll just go in as Bristol today and then we'll click launch eCert. And that will take you into your applications section. So this is where you do all of your um, application related admin. So you've got your dashboard here. This landing page is um, mainly just for our notes to tell you anything that we think that you need to know. So any closures, um, anything to do with volume, processing, times, um, opening and closing over Christmas, things like that. Um, so just do keep a, an eye on that because we do change those um, to, uh, as, as and when things are, are updated. 
um, you've got your applications tab and you've got your stored data, which we'll have a look at uh, a bit later, and your settings. So when you, um, when you register to eCert, we will be notified at the chamber that you've created a company account. Once we've seen that you've created an account, we'll email you a formal undertaking. So that's just a form which basically tells us um, who is authorised to sign on behalf of the company. So everyone will need to fill out that um, form. So it's one form, but you can have as many signatories on that as you like. So if you have multiple employees who'll be doing the applications, some of them are listed on there um, as an authorised signatory. We'll go in and we'll upload your signatures to the account so that when you do an application, it will pull through your signature into the relevant places. So um, if you don't find that you get an email uh, with the formal undertaking, I believe you can download it from eCert as well. It does prompt you, I think, in the email. Um, but that's the, the sort of first stage once you've registered. We'll get you to do your formal and we'll upload your signatures into there. If you're the admin of the account, you can upload signatures yourself. Um, but we just ask that if you do that, that you let us know so that we um, can do the admin our side as well and pop the contact information onto our system um, and also prompt you to have them fill out the formal undertaking as an authorised signatory as well. So you can just do that by clicking new and then going here, you would add your name and job title and you click upload and then it will bring up um, the image of the um, the signature and you select around it and save it so it's quite quite straightforward but if you get stuck or if you need help we can do it for you as well so that's your settings and you have your account defaults there as well so the primary thing that we're going to be looking at now is um, an application so if you click on your applications tab you'll see if you've been doing applications already this is where all of your applications are um, it will show you the status as well here. So once it's been submitted, it will show you that it's pending. Um, if it's been rejected for any amendments, it will go red and it will say rejected. Um, and once it's processed, it will go green and it will say processed. So you can see, you can track the um, stage of your application as you go through. Um, we'll click on new and that will bring up uh, a reference box. So this is just a reference for you. Um, so that you can find your application um, at a later date in the list, because as you can see, they do um, they do clock up quite quickly, um, and you you will see that those applications will stay there for as long as you like. So unless you delete them, um, they will just stay on your list, and uh, you can copy those as well if you have done a previous application and you um, are, are doing another one for the same thing. Um, with a few different different items that are different, you can just click on the copy application button and it will do an exact copy to the top of the list. Um, so you don't have to fill it all out um, from scratch every time. So I've created my new um, application here and it will, it will always put the newest one to the top. So we'll click into that. And You'll see as you go through, um, it's very step by step. So each box will have on the right hand side some blue boxes um, telling you what that section is for and how to complete it. Um, so we'll start off with the destination country. This is really just going to indicate to eCert what type of document you're allowed to do. So um, it, it is um, intelligent to a certain degree. So if you select a country which isn't part of the Carnet scheme, it won't give you the option to do a Carnet. So you do have to select a Carnet country um, in order to get the Carnet um, option. So I'm going to choose Australia. So now you can see there are some options which have been greyed out because we can't do those documents for that country, but it does have the Carnet option, which is good. So we're going to tick on Carnet and then it removes everything else. And the only relevant thing that's left is to upload your own invoice or documents. So you might want to do this if you're um, an agent and you want to give us the letter of authority, um, or if you're doing it for a country which requires an indemnity letter, or if you're going to a trade fair, something like that. So 
if you want to upload any documents with your application, just select that one as well and make sure it's ticked. And then it will give you the tab to upload a document with your application. If you're not going to do that, then just leave it unticked and just do the carne. So I'll leave it unticked for now and we'll click next. And then you'll see it's brought up the tab on the left for the ATA carne, which we'll get to very shortly. Um, and then we just want to select our signature. So all the signatures that are in our settings will show in this drop down box. Um, if you're the admin, as I said before, you can add new signatures as well. Um, so you want to select your own signature. Um, we always ask that you use your own signature um, just because uh, it makes it easier to, to understand who is actually applying for the carne um, and to make sure that everyone is an authorised signatory. Um, so select your own signature and then you can change the reference there if you need to. Click save and it will take you on to the carne itself. So you can see an example, so sort of a template there of the front cover of the carne and also the general list on the back. So there are a couple of ways you can complete this. You can click into the boxes and you can see some of the boxes um, are not clickable. That's just there for your, for your reference basically so that it gives you an example of the front cover. Um, or you can click into the um, red cross. So any of these down the left hand side, if you just click the heading, it will take you into that box straight away rather than trying to find out where it is that you still need to fill out. So box A is the first one up here. This is the holder name and address. So this is um, always populated automatically depending on the stored data in your um, account. So if you registered your company account and you popped a typo in by accident in the address or you did your home postcode or something like that, it will pull that through automatically. So we'd always recommend you just double check that what it's pulled through into that holder address box is correct. Um, if you wanted to amend anything, you just click into the box and you can amend it line by line if you want to, um, like that. Um, or you can, if you wanted to change this entire address and holder name. So for example, if you were um, an agent and you just had an agent account, so you had your one agent account that you log into, but you handle the paperwork for um, lots of exporters, you can store in your stored data all of your different exporter names and addresses. So if you were to click into your exporters, you'll see we've got lots of test things here. Um, you can click new and you can add as many exporters, names and addresses as you like. So you would just put your reference here, that's for you. The name and address will appear in the holder box. So you would program that in, click save. And then once you're in your application in holder box A, there will be an option to choose an exporter from your stored data. So once you've programmed in all your exporters, if you wanted to do that, it would show all here. You would just select the one that you wanted to, click save, and it will pull it through to box A instead of what was pulled through automatically from your account. So we'll leave it as Bristol for now, and we'll move on to box B. So this is the represented by box. So this is going to be the list of who can actually carry the carne through customs and who's authorised to sign the declaration for um, the carne itself. So there is one template which you can select. If you don't know who's going to be carrying your carne, you can't put their names in yet. So um, you can choose any authorised representative and it will put the um, the wording in there for you automatically and that means that uh, at, at, when you do know who it is that's going to be carrying the carne you can use the to whom um, it may concern letter which is always attached to the front of a carne and you can authorize the individuals at that stage so as long as you put any authorized representative you can authorize whoever you like before um, before you actually leave so if you didn't want to do that and you wanted to enter some individuals, you would leave it as no template. You can pop the name in. 
You can put full names if you want to, um, or you can just put the first initial and the last name. We would just recommend that you make sure it matches a passport. So um, if you are doing full names, don't use nicknames or shortened names. Um, so use the full birth names um, or just the first, first initial and the last name. So you can just put the names. Um, if you didn't want to authorize anyone else, you can untick that box there. So it won't print plus any authorized representative. It wouldn't really be recommended to untick that. There's no reason why you shouldn't put plus any authorized representative. You always want to make sure that you can authorize somebody else should you need to. If that's not on there, the only people listed in the represented by box can carry the carnet. So we would say leave plus any authorized representative on there and then you can authorize whoever you need should anyone not be able to travel for any reason. So you can add the names in there. Um, if you added plus any authorized yourself and you left that ticked, it would add it twice, which we don't really want to see. So um, you can see when it pops up, it will have it two, two times. So just make sure you don't ever need to put plus any authorized as long as you have it ticked. So we'll save that. And we'll go on to box C. So this is your intended use. So you've got three categories here. You've got commercial samples, international trade fair and professional equipment. Um, for those of you who are, who are familiar with Carnets, you'll know that not all countries accept all categories. Um, so you'll just need to select the categories that you do need to use um, for your carnet. Um, if you select a category, um, you'll see later on there should flash up um, any notices to say that the, the country that you've selected um, doesn't accept carnets for the category that you've chosen, um, and it will ask if you want to proceed. So there are cases where we may still issue a carnet. I think for Canada, we technically only accept commercial samples, but we can issue for professional equipment. Sometimes they're interchangeable. Um, but we might get you to fill out an indemnity letter just saying that you're aware that the carnet might be um, refused at customs. So you just select your category there and then it will also ask you to categorize your goods. So there are all the categories here. Again, for those who are familiar with the numbers, you'll see that they aren't actually numbered, but they are in the correct order. So if you know that your category is category six, um, then you can just you'll see it's the sixth place in the list. Um, if you find that you can't categorise your goods for any reason, if you don't think they fall into any of these categories, do let us know and we can always contact London and they might um, try and uh, recategorise um, these um, different sections because there are some which aren't really used anymore like stamps. So um, yeah, if you have any problems with categorising, then just uh, give us a shout at the Chamber and we'll help you. So we'll save that for box C and we'll move on to box P, which is our destination countries. So you can add as many countries here as you need to, as many countries as you'll be visiting. Um, it's wise to add all the countries that you think that you think you're going to be um, going to at this time, um, because they do appear in box P as the countries. It lists it will only list the countries that you are bonding this carnet for. It won't list all the countries um, in the carnet scheme. So if you think you might be going to a country, pop it on. Um, you can add countries to a carnet after it's been issued, um, but we would just need the carnet back in the office to add it um, and make sure that it's uh, alteration approved. So it is possible, it just ha adds an extra step and, and it involves getting the carnet back to us um, at the office. So select your countries here. So as I said at the start, we did choose Australia. That really just indicated to ESA that uh, what documents we could produce. So we can choose Australia again. Um, we want to enter the number of visits that we're going to do for this country. So this is the number of times you're going to be entering the customs union. So the number of times you're going to be going through customs into Australia. So if you're just going in once, you put one visit. I'm going to add that and it will give me another line and I can then add another country. Um, for those who um, go to the EU, um, you can choose the European Union and that's just classed as one country because it's one customs union. 
So you don't need to add all of the um, individual European countries. Um, you, we don't need to know your itinerary that you're going to France, Spain, Germany. So just European Union once and the number of visits and that's the number of visits you're going to be making into the EU. So the number of times you're crossing the border into the EU. Once you're in the EU, you've got free movement. You can move around um, through the countries and we don't need to know that you're going to be visiting three different countries in the EU. You wouldn't put three or four different times that you're going in. It's really just the number of times you're going into the EU. So you'll see there's a box here called number of transits. Transits aren't very common. Um, mainly used um, when transiting through Switzerland. So Switzerland is not part of the European Union. Um, if you're not actually going to be visiting Switzerland, but your route might take you through Switzerland, um, you're not stopping, you're just transiting through the country, um, then you would put one in the transit box um, to make sure that we can issue you with the correct number of vouchers. So these visits here, the number of visits you're putting here, we also want to know the number of exits from the UK because some people might have their um, itinerary to leave once from the UK. They might fly straight from the UK into Australia, then they might fly straight from Australia to the EU. So although they're traveling around, they're only exiting from the UK once. Some people might be going out to one country, so leaving the UK into Australia, coming back to the UK, and then going back out to the EU. So that would be two exits. So this is just indicating to us at the Chamber how many um, vouchers and counterfoils we need to give you. We'll always give you a couple of extra, just in case uh, there are any errors that are made um, at customs. It does happen. They do stamp the wrong box sometimes. So we want to make sure that you're covered. So we always give you a few extra. And if you're not sure, again, please just um, pop us an email or give us a call at the chamber and we can help you with your itinerary. So we've done our destination box there and you can see we've got um, Australia and the European Union there. Hopefully. It didn't add it. Let me go back. Now, it didn't add it through because I didn't click add. So that's something to watch. So you might put, pop it in there, but it won't pull it through until you click add. So now it's brought up another, another line. So now I want to save it and it will bring it through. There we go. So we've got Australia in the third countries and in the European Union, it just puts European Union. So our box piece finished now, and then we'll move on to the general list. So this is probably the area which takes up most time, as, as some of you are, are probably aware. Um, so this um, will give you a few options on how to provide your list. This is probably the reason why we tried to get, transfer everyone over to ESERT because of um, the challenges that are um, raised at the chamber formatting um, Excel spreadsheets, um, taking off extra columns, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this will really streamline it for everybody. So um, if you've only got a few items, you can just add your item description one by one. You can put your number of pieces. The unit box is grayed out. That's primarily because it's not really used. You can enable the unit column if you really need to, um, but most people tend not to need it. So the weight, um, that will always be in kilos. So if it's a full kilo, you can put one. If it's half a kilo, you can put 0.5. So it's, it's kilo weight there. So we'll put one kilo. That's a very light car. And maybe it's a toy. Um, and then we've got um, the value here. That's in pounds sterling. So the last thing we need to pop in is the origin. So we need to put in the two-letter um, ISO country code here which we know is GB for the United Kingdom. Um, we do accept the UK, but the official one is GB. So if you leave this calculated, if we add a line, that will, um, if we leave that calculate box ticked, it will add up all of the lines and it will enter the values on the list as a total. So you can see it's adding the list as you go along. So you click add and it's numbering them automatically for you so it can see we've put two pieces in the number of pieces so it's given us item number two to three if you click heading this hd means heading so sometimes you might want to indicate the packing um, this often happens where you've got tele cases flight cases and you want that heading to be on there some people like to indicate what items are actually in a certain case they might have a case that's 
for a specific person. So instead of adding it as an item, if you click heading, it will add it as bold as an item. So you can put Kelly Case, Henry, containing. And then that will appear as a bold heading and anything underneath that now will in, be indicated that it is in that Kelly Case. If you have lots and lots of items, you don't want to be adding this line by line. So you can then download the CSV template. So this will open up in Excel. I'm gonna remove, actually, I think if I click download, it will remove all of this anyway. So I'm going to open up the CSV workbook and you'll see it's a, a template format with all of the columns. Um, it will look slightly different to the um, Excel spreadsheet that you might be used to that we've been using at the chamber, um, but it's the same information. So it's the same headings. Hopefully you can see that. So we'll just expand the description box there. Um, it's pulled everything through. So if you do add it line by line, if you open up the CSV, it will pull through what you've put on those lines. You can replace the lines, you can delete them. So if I made a mistake, I'm going to delete that line. So we want to make sure that all of those columns are filled out. The unit isn't necessary, so we don't need to put that in for, for this um, item. And you can see where we had that HD box, it's now showing you as heading. That needs to either say false or true. So if it is a heading, you can put true. If it's not, just put false. So it will need to indicate whether it is or isn't a heading. Um, and we always want to see either no serial number like that, or NSN, um, or if it does have a serial number, we want to know what the serial number is. So all items should either indicate serial number or NSN. So once you save this, you want to save it as, um, a CSV file. So leave that type of uh, file as a CSV and that will enable you to then upload it to your application. You don't need to add any totals. So you'll see on our list, um, you have to put the totals um, and it won't number the pieces either. So there's no numbering down this line um, because it does it automatically for you depending on the number of pieces in column B. Um, so once you save this, I've already saved it, so I'm going to use one that I've already saved. You can click Upload CSV, and you just go to find your file that you've just created. If you already have, um, you might have your own spreadsheet um, with all of your products on, um, you can then just drag and drop those or copy and paste onto the CSV description box. So it's quite, quite easy to use. Um, so it will say, do you want to replace all of your items before it does uh, when you're uploading? So I do, so I'm going to click OK. It tells us that it's uploaded successfully and it's replaced our items with the stuff that was in my CSV that I've just uploaded. So if I click save, that will add it to our general list on the back. So you can see then it adds it for us. It does the total of the, the value. So that's why we don't need to add the value total or anything like that on the CSV file. You literally just fill out the columns and it will calculate it for you. That's the best way um, we'd like you to do the list because it is the most straightforward both sides. If you do want to use our um, spreadsheet that you're used to, you can, that's fine. We, we just ask that you don't reformat it. Um, we ask that you don't add any columns because that list is formatted uh, to print onto the carnet in the right place. Um, so if you do use that format, please just leave it as it is um, and email the team. The only thing that we ask you um, not to do really, if you click change how the general list is provided, it will give you an option to upload it to eCert. But if you upload something to eCert, it changes it to a PDF, which is very helpful because we can't extract the information. So we'd really like you to either create it in, in eCert, either line by line or downloading this CSV, 
or um, you can choose to email it to us at the chamber um, if you really need to. Um, if you do choose to email it to us, it will ask you to enter the value of the goods, the total value, because in a moment it will need that value to calculate um, the values of um, the security and the guarantee value. So enter your value there. So we've 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 done it in ESA. I'm going to leave that um, as it was. So the last thing that it's got here now is the security. So this is the security um, for the carnet itself. So this isn't an insurance to cover the goods. Hopefully you'll have done that yourself separately. This is to secure the carnet. It's a guarantee, basically, that um, you will pay any claims or um, fines that are given from overseas customs should the carnet be used incorrectly or should any of the goods which are on the list that have been taken into a country should they be left there or lost if they haven't left the country you may be open to um, a claim from the overseas customs so um, this is a security to say that should you um, be asked for those claims you will pay it um, if you don't for any reason, if the company goes into liquidation, etc., we then invoke the guarantee and the, the monies are paid by the guarantor. So you can secure the carnet in a couple of ways. Um, you can give a, a cash deposit. Um, so this cash deposit will be calculated um, depending on the value of the goods uh, and the countries that you're visiting um, and also the type of goods you're taking. It will be the full guarantee value. So this can be quite pricey depending on the value of the goods, etc. So you would need to lodge that in full in cash, uh, either as a bank draft cash or check in cleared funds to us at the chamber. And we would hold that deposit for the full 33 months, um, for which time customs are able to issue a claim um, after the carnet has been used. So. Once the carnet has been returned to us, if we're happy that a claim isn't going to be issued, we might choose to return that deposit to you because we know that there's no there's no possibility that a claim is going to come in. If we think that a claim may come in, we might retain the whole deposit, as I say, for 33 months, or we might return part, part of the deposit, um, calculating, um, taking into account uh, the, the monies which we think may be claimed on. So that's the that's the deposit security. The most, uh, the most common version of the security is the immediate cover using our in-house indemnity scheme. So that's the immediate cover here. So this is where you would pay a premium, like any other insurance premium, um, it's non-refundable. So you pay a premium and they provide you with the cover. So that premium is again calculated on the um, guarantee value. So you'll see here it says immediate cover for £650. So ESA has calculated using the information we've input already that the guarantee value for our carnet is £650. That's not what you're going to be paying. Um, that is the guarantee value. So the immediate cover is a premium. And if we choose that, I'll show you a bit later on, it will bring another uh, form up and it will show you the premium costs. So it will show you how much it will cost you. To um, pay for that premium. The last one is um, the guarantee using your own bank. bank. So you can guarantee um, using an own, your own bank or insurance company, uh, but they do have to be FSC um, registered, I believe. So if you wanted to do that, we have a form which we can send you and you would give that form to your bank and have them fill it out and then you would send it back to us um, to, to uh, prove that you've got that guarantee in place yourself. So there is one last option here, which is a continuing guarantee, um, and that's really the same as the immediate cover, um, but it's an annual um, guarantee. It's an annual cover. So that's really only used for the high, very high volume carne um, uh, users who need that guarantee in place for, um, for continuing use throughout the year. So as I say, most people will be using this immediate cover. And if we leave that selected and we click save, on the left hand side you'll see it will ping up a new tab so we've got now a viva guarantee so we thought we were done but we're not quite there yet so we'll fill out the aviva guarantee here um, most of it will be completed automatically depending on what you've inputted already into your application 
So again, just give it a quick scan over so you know that it's um, entered everything properly. You can click into the boxes that are pre-populated and amend it if you, if you see that it's wrong. Um, it might pull it through from the list, so you may need to change the list and re-upload it. Um, the one thing in this box here we need to fill out is the nature of the business. And it will also ask you, there's a small tick box, are the goods insured on an all-risk basis so this is in relation to your goods insurance so are they insured on an all risk basis and we just want to know yes or no so if they are you would tick it if they're not you would leave it unticked so we'll save that and then we have one last red cross here which is the duration so this is how long you want to secure the carne for a carnet is valid for one year from the date of issue minus the day. So you, you can use that carnet for one year, but you need to tell us how long you want to have the guarantee, the security in place for. So you can choose two, six or 12 months. Obviously, you can only choose 12 months once. Um, but if you choose to secure for two months and you go out and you find actually they've extended the shoot or they've changed it, you want to rebond it or extend the bond, you can just let us know and you can extend the bond another two or six months, um, you may need to pay an additional um, fee to cover any um, additional countries if you add any different countries or um, just to pay the difference in the extension of the bond. So we'll choose the duration there. You've got the geographical limits already filled out because we've told them that we're going to Australia. Um, if you're going to the European Union and a third country, it will always select worldwide because if you're going to a worldwide country it will always choose worldwide um, regardless of whether you're going to the EU as well if you're only going to the EU it will show Europe so um, it will also have your goods type here as well which you can change if you decide to change your goods at that stage so we'll save this and leave it as it is and you'll see that's 100% complete now so we've done our application that's everything we need to fill out um, and we can check out if you're not familiar with these forms and you don't have a copy of them, of all the wording, it would be recommended to um, print a copy um, so that you know what you're signing. Because we've uploaded your signature, it will pull through your signature automatically onto these forms and it will sign them for you. So just make sure you know what you're signing. So we'll go through the checkout stage and I'll show you that in a second. We've got the two services here. So we at Bristol Chamber don't offer two levels of service. We offer one service level. We don't give a priority or an emergency service. Um, we aim to process all applications received by one o'clock the same day. This, is, this does come with some provisos. So if you have um, multiple carnets, for example, if you're doing um, a batch of four or five carnets and you are wanting to do those applications all at once, that's absolutely fine. Um, but we would say that the cutoff time of one o'clock doesn't really apply there. We would need to have them slightly earlier. So this cutoff time is there in place so that we have time physically to put your carnet together. So although you're doing an application electronically, this is still going to produce a paper document for you. Customs and, and the carnet scheme isn't quite there yet with an electronic service. Um, so it's still a paper document. So we need to print this off for you. And it does take time. We have to stamp the pages. We have to number everything. We have to print it all off in the right boxes. Um, if you change an item and we've already issued the carnet, it could cause problems. So we can go back and forth, but that's why we don't offer um, two levels of service. And we just have the cutoff times instead. So we have a one o'clock cutoff as long as your application is co correct um, and the list is correct and we don't need to have any amendments or anything like that, we aim to process them the same day. So as I say, if you have a multi-batch uh, of carnets, we would ask you to get them to us by 11 o'clock really at the latest in order to get them done the same day. So we'll choose our service here. If you do find that it is urgent, you can select priority service and it will alert us when your application comes through with an exclamation mark. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we'll process that one um, any quicker. Uh, we always work in the order that the carnets come in. So just give us a call. If you're concerned, just contact the team and we'll always try and work with you um, within your constraints as well. So we want to select a delivery method. So as I say, it's going to be a printed carnet. So we'll collect, 
uh, select standard, and then it will give us an option for postage. So we never send carnets first class, we always send them a minimum special delivery. We wouldn't really do overseas because you need the carnet in the UK in order to stamp it out the UK. Um, you can have it couriered if you're sending it to an agent or someone else who's using it for you. So choose your postage method there and we'll click proceed to order summary. And at, that's, at this stage then, you will be given um, an example, a preview of your forms. So at this stage, it will probably be recommended for you to preview your forms and just print them off for your records so that you know what you've signed and you can read all of the all of the information in those as well. So it will come with two application forms. So we've got your, your formal undertaking application and this is what we would use as well. So we always face check your carnets against all of this information here. So it should all be correct and it should all match because it's all pulling through from the same place on ESERT. So as long as you didn't enter any um, anything incorrectly, it should all be the same. So it will show us how many visits. So this tells us how many vouchers to issue. It tells us your um, category, et cetera. So here's, here's your, for, your formal undertaking in your application form. And you can see there it's pulled through my signature as well. So you can print that off. You can save it. Um, you've got your Aviva guarantee form there as well, which you can do the same with. You can open it up and just check to see what it is that you've um, signed. Um, and it will also show you here. So this is what I was saying about the premium. Um, if you're using the specific um, indemnity, the, the immediate cover. So that's your premium value. So that's the price you'll pay for your premium. Um, that doesn't include the issue fee for the car name. So just bear that in mind. It's not the full fee. It's just premium, um, which is calculated on your guarantee amount there. You've got your goods value, your guarantee amount and your premium. So there's your um, guarantee form. And you can also preview the carnet as well. Not that you can use it for anything, but you might want a copy of it just for your records. So that will give you a kind of white paper copy. It says draft all across it. So it is just for your purposes to reference. And then you've got your signature there. So we'll click proceed to payment. Um, you will know um, if you've been using our services that we only um, have an account method. So we just invoice you for the cost um, once we've issued the carnet. And there's a box here where you can send a message to us. So if you want us to deliver your carnet to someone other than yourself, you can pop the delivery address in there. Or if you just want to say hello, <laughs> you can pop any message in there that you like, um, as long as it's nice, hopefully. And then you the, the terms and conditions. Um, it won't let you submit until you've confirmed those. And then you click submit. So I won't submit it and confuse the team today. But once you have submitted, it will pop up and say application submitted successfully. And you'll also receive um, an email as well from ESA to say that it's been submitted and it's pending. So once you've submitted that, you can see in your applications list, it will say pending in the status. So you can see a little example there, that one's rejected. So it will say pending. And once it's been approved, it will turn to um, processed. Um, if you have any concerns, if you're not sure um, if we've seen your application, et cetera, as long as it's been submitted fully, we will have received it. Um, but just contact the team if you have um, any concerns at all. So hopefully that's given you a good example um, of how we do an application on ESERT. So um, I will just um, hopefully stop that recording now.